Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in the interest of interdisciplinary work, I'm actually an anthropologist. But, uh, all archaeologists in America are anthropologists, so there you go. Right, so um, this afternoon I want to talk about um, the results of um, uh, our field walking and the area around Worcester. Um, we, uh, we're going to present some of the results of the Worcester Porcelain Project, as it's known now, as we call it which has been a field walking excavation project right now at the University of Worcester Archaeology Program. So this is student-led research, or student-involved research. Um, we aim to discuss how, using our results, we have been able to cast light on pottery production for the Worcester porcelain factories uh, during the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. Uh, we want to discuss how, using uh, historical and documentary evidence, together with material remains of the process of manufacture, We've been able to infer elements of the Chen casting light on late Georgian and Victorian industrial practice. And then finally, uh, we're looking at patterns of discard we think shed light on economic and social conditions of the factory workers at that time. So we're going to have a look and see what we can learn from the um, archaeology. Okay, so um, because we can't excavate the factory sites, people keep telling me, Oh, but, you know, the thought of production site said, yeah, I know, the production site is currently a museum or under the Worcester Tech. So, you know, let's, let's be honest, we know where the factory sites are. Um, because we couldn't excavate them, we are relying on field survey data in the environs of Worcester for our uh, material. Um, and up, at, up into the first and, uh, or second centuries of uh, Worcester, a uh, rubbish collection, both domestic and industrial, was collected and sold to farmers who dumped the material either uh, on fields either as a form of night soil or maybe filled in barrow pits that were you know working pits around in and around the city. So consequences consequently, our methods included field walking and artifact pickup using student archaeologists walking transects across the fields in blocks with specific finds located using GPS. Um, and each field had that we selected had historically been the subject of repeated rubbish dumping. Um, and each field we looked at had no previous um, evidence uh, or history of occupation and building. So we're looking at long-term uh, agricultural deposit. So our project had a number of methodological challenges. That's most not every project, really. Okay, so um, it took a little, it has taken us some time to get a grips with. Well, first off, there's the sheer quantity of material that has uh, what we have um, collected over the years. So um, we estimated that if you excluded brick and tile, we could easily collect between uh, somewhere around 20,000 artifacts in two or three days collection using eight, uh, between 10 and 20 students. So 20,000 pieces of stuff, you know, and I think most people don't bother to pick this stuff up because, you know, it's 20,000 pieces of stuff. Um, the assemblage itself that we collected arranged in date from middle Paleolithic through to present day, though all three fields were dominated by 18th, 19th, and early 20th century materials. And the materials collected fell into three categories, uh, domestic refuse, agricultural refuse, and factory waste. So this slide here shows us um, some, of the, um, some, of the some of the resources we used. Um, so sorting this material um, concentrated on a few easily identifiable uh, characterizing features. We had factory waste, we had transfer wares, and we had hand-painted chinas. And this is where one of our major problems arose. So this is the Worcestershire ceramic database. Archaeologists will know this. This is, you know, look at the temper, right? So it's quite substantial. But you can see, if you just see lots of tables here, right? Our entire project, all well, the 18th, 19th, 20th century stuff, fell into three categories: Worcester porcelain, uh, unitary, creamware, which is late 18th, early 19th century, and then modern china. That's it. Right? So we had, this is our local resource, this is our collection. These are the actual historical types possible from the same collection. This is a, a typology that arose from the Boston, Boston City Museum in the States. So this is one of the, the kind of problems with the um, So like I say, um, the first category of Worcester porcelain is quite complex in and of itself. Dr. Wool's factory was the first to produce a porcelain um, in uh, 1751, but Chamberlain's, which was another factory in the area, worked in competition with them from the 1780s onwards, and then Granger's began producing a semi-porcelain in 1848. 
all three factories shared or traded ownership and workforce, eventually merging in the late 1880s. So there's a, it's not a straightforward, you know, the Worcester porcelain, it's actually porcelain is plural. The factories produced during this time, uh, things they produced included, ooh, she says using somebody else's laptop is our damn thing, is a bit like using somebody else's underwear. Pocket works so so good. Um, so the products produced at this time included um, um, hard, uh, soft paste porcelains, hard paste porcelains, and bone chinas. Creamwares are this hard bodied stuff, hard bodied china, which I've already talked about, and then the bulk of the rest of the domestic stuff includes um, transfer wares, earthenwares like mochas, uh, polychrome painted ceramics, um, and uh, including a bit of white wood. Um, so the factory waste for our project, we concentrated specifically on um, the factory waste for this particular project, in this particular talk. And this consists of kind of what, what we now think is very familiar items, Saggers, various types of kiln furniture, which is props, um, and some testers, um, porcelain wasters, and glazed wasters. So that's the kind of stuff that we're looking at. We have a third category of, of waster, which we're going to think about in the end, which is, called, which is white glazed. And we're, this is an interesting project, which, problem, which is that it doesn't correspond easily to the topic of waster. Um, we've also found a number of other types of wasters in the area, buff slipware, red and black wares, earthen wares, refined earthen wares, stone wares, and so forth. None of these are supposed to be produced locally. So we, that's, if you know anything about factory production, pottery production, generally speaking, wasters are an indication of local production. So we're finding stuff that we shouldn't find, which is always easy. Okay, so um, our field walking took, took place in a number of fields in Worcester. So uh, on the St. John's side of, of the river, River Severn, Western side of River Severn, Oldbury Farm, Lower Broad Heath, and Hallow. Um, the University of Worcester is actually right in here, and this is Worcester, University of Worcester land, so thanks to them. The original factories that were involved here, um, the first Worcester factory is on, um, uh, is Wall Street's house, sorry. Uh, it then moved to Severn Street. Chamberlain's uh, was up here on Bath Road between 18, 1783 and 1851. Granger's operated at Lowe's Moor in 1809 to 1903. And 7th Street ran, therefore, from 1840 to 2008 when the factory went to administration. Um, this is an indication of the total fines. Uh, this is without brick and tile. So Hallow had over 3,000. Um, this little thing here is how percentage of wasters. Uh, Lower Broad Heath, over 7,000 um, with these associated wasters and Oldbury Farm far less with fewer wasters. But that's a sort of typical, those are our finds. Um, this is a plotted density of the finds at one of the sites. This is to show you that the finds are not homogeneously distributed across the fields. We have solid areas of, of concentration. Um, and this includes uh, different areas of domestic and of uh, domestic refuse and factory waste. Um, one of the interesting things about this field, which we'd like to show, is that it had a very large percentage of saggers. Like, this is factory waste, so a very high concentration of saggers, which wasn't apparent in other fields. Um, there's anecdotal evidence that this material, the wasters, and the sagas and so forth are actually being marketed as field improvement, soil improvements, because they improve drainage or maybe used for that. That seems to be the anecdotal evidence. Okay, this slide shows the, the other, another site, uh, Oldbury Farm, which has slightly different um, uh, distribution, which is just worth a comparison. They're not all the same, all of the fields the same. One of the interesting things about this site is it had far more rural courseware um, and less overall uh, domestic material, um, and then um, a pretty decent amount of factory waste. So factory waste remains a kind of significant percentage. Um, one of the other things is that these densities, these hot spots will occur around gateways. That seems to be the standard uh, thing, which shouldn't surprise anybody. But don't forget, this is all done in pre, pre, uh, pre, um, things with engines, cars, that's one. <laughs> Horses and wagons, or down the River Severn on Canal Marches and dumped over, and 
Worcester Porcelain had a pony and a cart, as well as canal boats, which they're known for. Um, so uh, this slide is comparing the differences in, in, in percentages and densities, just to kind of give you an overall picture, picture of the numbers. It's worth, it, you can really see the difference in, in disposal on this lower piece here. So um, uh, China's are quite, um, quite high, or we have a lot of China on both Hallow and Lower Broad Heath, not so much on Ombury Farm, but we have a lot of rural courseware in Ombury Farm and not so much on Hallow and Lower Broad Heath. Ironically, I think Ombury Farm's the closest factory, closest field to the factories, but has the least amount of wasters. Um, and then a um, um, good amount of factory waste, and then tin oxides, medieval, Roman or British, a lot of glass, clay pipes, etc. just to show you that we did actually look at more than just um, porcelain. Um, and this is to look at the percentage of wasters, that's not factory waste, but factory waste as part of the wasters. Factory wasters as part of the factory waste. And you have here Hallow, uh, which was a riverside site, had a highest proportion of bisque and glazed wasters as compared to the other two sites. And the glazed wasters are an interesting thing because, um, sort of the next one I'm going to show you is glazed wasters. Now, there's, an anecd there's anecdotal evidence that uh, biscuit fire, biscuit wares were the dominant uh, material discarded on the fields, and they preferred not to have glazed wasters. And this is anecdotal evidence. Confirm this with our finds so far. But the glazed wasters are a problematic category at the best of times, I'm afraid. Um, um, we have an additional issue, which is we have a large quantity of plain white shirts in the fields, very large quantity. And they are the dominant form for the dominant percentage. So at the three farms we looked at, um, the, percent, the, the overall numbers of, waste, of white glaze wear were almost double in some cases, and certainly a 25% more. And they certainly uh, were more than the, the porcelain wasters. And this is the white stuff. Now, our problem is that cream wear is kind of a high-end thing that didn't last very long. So why do, percent, why do we have such a high percentage of plain white pottery? And it is just, and it, and it has a variety of colors. So it is one of the issues where we think uh, if you were to add the white wasters to the, threat to the waster, sorry, if you add the white glaciers to the porcelain wasters, you'd have a huge quantity. Well, we can't actually yet disturb, disting, distinguish between what's a waster and what's not in this category. So this is a complicated category. But we have some evidence that might help us uh, look into that a little bit better. Um, never mind. Let's see where I start losing track of There we go. Right. So that's the numbers. That's the, that's the archaeology, right? How do we interpret this? Now, we're looking at what's effectively garbage dumping. This is factory, this is factory waste. This is the the, the, the pollution effect of modern technology. And so, you know, this is sort of one of the things we have to deal with. Um, and you get to see, as, you know, as, as lovely Bill Rafsky says, you get to see all the stuff that nobody wants to see. The value you didn't know. So we're learning, you know, we've learned a lot of interesting elements of the process over the 19th century, and one of which is that you should never believe the history is written by the people who own the factories. That's probably, you have some good ideas, but there's some interesting things. So, one of the nice things is that Worcester Royal, or Royal Worcester, has promoted their own manufacturing successes since the very beginning. Um, this is a, a local historian by the name of uh, Ray Jones. Uh, he's published a number of uh, books about the topic, and he has uh, reproduced a series of illustrated postcards which show the manufacturing process as it's broken down. And this was actually done by Worcester itself. Right, so now we're looking in at our own finds to see if we can't match the finds with the processes as been um, described. So in the first tier, we also found um, that we can subsequently, thanks to social history and oral history, start identifying groups of workers who are engaged in these different practices. So we're going to see these people being reflected in the archaeological record. So this is the first slide. This is the, the, the clay processing phase. And you've got uh, evidence of grinding mill, and you have the slip kilns, and these are the sort of basic processes of making the material. 
And the remains we have from that include these really odd bits of fired porcelain, which we think are testers. We think they're either testing the fabric constituents or testing the kiln quality or kiln, kiln conditions. We're not sure which it is. But they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, and they're quite, uh, quite dramatic. We mostly get them, actually, we get them on all three sides. The other thing is we just have little odd bits like pencils. And this is not a very good picture, but it looks like just pencil drawings on this particular piece of biscuit ware. So that's like phase one. Then the next phase is uh, the forming of the vessels. And traditionally, Worcester Royal um, did uh, wheel through a lot of its porcelain for years, in fact, into the 20th century, unlike a lot of other companies that carry on using real made pottery. Um, however, uh, they also molded and, and jigged in a whole series of other things. So these are just examples of some of the stuff that we found. I like that one in particular. Uh, I can't decide whether it's supposed to be like this or it might be like this. It's a, it looks like a dolphin, we don't know. Uh, and some formed uh, molded pottery there. These are biscuit fire. And then this is the biscuit kiln. And from that, we get uh, saggers and uh, props as well. So these are sort of elements here. Um, it's worth noting that in the industry, this is piecework here. So people were only paid for complete vessels coming out of the kilns. So, ooh, crank. <laughs> you know, you have a good time and it just runs along. <laughs> we are almost there. So at this point, if all this material in the field means people were not being paid. So then which comes first then? The next step is to decorate the material. So the white glazed wares, are they underglazed? There's two theories. Either you underglazed it, and you put the transfer on top, or you transferred it, and then you put the glaze on top. We have evidence of both. Um, we've got the, uh, the glazed, uh, the overglazed um, wasters that did not make the final cut. We've got examples of women's work, which was the transfer transfer layers, um, we have evidence where they were transferring directly onto biscuit ware and then not making the cut. And then we have the second kiln, the gloss kiln, where we have the transfer wares coming through and then failing at that end as well. Finally, we have the embellishing, which is the big stuff. Um, there's somewhere between 30 and 60 people involved in the high-end pottery at Worcester Royal. Um, it included enameling. This is some failed enameling. Um, and it also included for gilding and burnishing. And this is a piece of royal lily, which is not as far as the burnishers is 24 karat gold before it was um, disposed of. And you have other bits and pieces. The burnishers were all women. The transfer workers were all women. The painters were all men. The gilders were all men. The sagger workers, the kilnsmen, and the formers were men and boys. And then finally, we're looking at Waker's marks. So we have this lovely GCW, Granger's Chamberlain, Worcester Royal, merger mark. Um, um, which is all three, but we're also getting this stuff here, which is made for uh, John Wiley Company in Montreal, Canada, by Royal Worcester that never made it over. So we have an entire collection of that. So, in, in effect, um, in summary, a couple of quick, quick, quick points that I feel worth emphasizing. Firstly, waste disposal was a key concern. The very start of Worcester Port production in the 18th century, disposal appears to have been discrete dumps in the neighboring uh, farmlands uh, in and around the modern city limits. Secondly, most waste relates to first biscuit firing, entailing labor of the lower classes of workers, i.e. mixers, throwers, molders, kilsmen, and boys, um, unless you add the undecorated whitewares, we don't know. Third, the largest group of workers therefore represented in the fields are women and children in the form of transfer wares and sagger fragments. Fourth, Fabrics represented in the wasters vary greatly over time, reflecting um, continuous ongoing experimentation. And finally, um, though the fields have abundant evidence remains of factory rejects, there's very little finished product represented in domestic refuse. This is consistent with the history of, of Royal Worcester Porcelain, which always strive to compete on a global market with Chinese and continental manufacturers. In conclusion, the emphasis has traditionally been placed on finding and identifying earliest examples of first period porcelain. Our interests are to piece together the archaeological picture of industrial practice from production used discard as part of understanding the role of Royal Worcester on the international product porcelain markets of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. The Kipling quote uh, reflects the lack of interest in the UK in this type of pottery production 
And for most of this paper, we've had to rely on Australian, Canadian, American, Finnish, and other world archaeological literatures. So thank you very much for that.